Welcome to the Focus and Chill podcast, where we discuss productivity tactics that work for neurodiverse individuals. Every episode, we interview guests with lived experience of neurodiversity who also have a solid productivity and habit game, and pass the learnings on to you, our wise and benevolent audience. We're your hosts, Jeremy and Joey. I'm Joey, and I coach creatives to get moving on their most ambitious projects through the power of solid habits and strong focus. I'm also a perpetual student of psychology and perpetually on a quest to a one-armed chin-up. And I'm Jeremy. I'm a neurodiverse software developer turned startup founder, building habit and focus software for people with ADHD. My cool party trick is leaving parties early so I get to sleep on time to do my three hour long morning routine. The Focus and Chill podcast is brought to you by Focus Bear, a habit and productivity app that makes healthy habits and deep work the path of least resistance. If you have a tendency to check emails or scroll through Instagram first thing in the morning, but long to develop a meditation and exercise habit first thing, Focus Bear can help you. The app blocks distractions on all your devices and guides you through your habits one at a time. Throughout the day, Focus Bear assists you to stay in deep work by blocking websites and apps that are unrelated to your chosen focus mode. Life's not all about work though. You'll be prompted to take regular breaks to rest your eyes and stretch your muscles. At the end of the day, Focus Bear helps you switch off. Work-related apps get hidden so you can unwind and sleep well. Check out the app by going to focusbear.io. Welcome to episode 15 of the Focus and Chill podcast. In today's episode, we are lucky to have Amanda Horsville with us today. Amanda is a digital editor, content and SEO strategist with more than 20 years experience across a variety of roles in the publishing sector. She also happens to have ADHD, an adult diagnosis that's changed her life for the better. Great to have you on the show, Amanda. Thanks for having me. So we're keen to hear about how your neurodiversity and in particular your late diagnosis of ADHD has impacted your productivity, both positively and negatively. Well, that's a very um, interesting question because before I was diagnosed, I obviously didn't know very much about what was going on. And so I developed a lot of coping strategies. Um, And since diagnosis, I've gone, oh, that was that was lucky because a lot of the things that I um, that I do a- and the way that I work has definitely been influenced by ADHD. So I'll start with the positive. Everybody likes the positive first. Uh, I guess um, being neurodiverse allows me to think a little bit differently from perhaps um, other people. Um, I've chosen to see this as a strength and. Um, it certainly has uh, been of great use in the media industry and uh, particularly with online publishing because, you know, quirky things always go wrong um, and you have to have, you know, interesting ways to fix them. The other thing is, um, you know, presenting information to people. Sometimes, you know, you can think of a, you know, a simile or a metaphor that maybe is apt that you wouldn't have got to um, without, you know, tangential thinking, as I like to to call it, um, or octopus thinking, which is more fun. And I guess negatively, the same thing, um, uh, I could just say say exactly the same thing as the positive things, is that um, I do think uh, a little bit differently from other people and sometimes uh, my thought processes um, don't make sense to some people and sometimes I forget to bring them on the journey with my thinking and so they're left in the dark staring at me going, what? <laughs> Which can be um, a little bit uh, confrontational at times but with work and um, finding my tribe and, you know, working with the people I work with to understand um, how they like to work and how I like to work. Um, we've reached a very nice place where when I do that, people will go, so can you just explain to me the thinking behind that, which is um, a term of endearment. <laughs> okay. So is it almost that in some ways you're two steps ahead of where they are and then it, it's hard for them to bridge that gap? I think I can relate to that as well, that I'll often have ideas and expect people to have almost the same mental state as me in all the context. And then I'm thinking, 
why is this not obvious to you? It seems obvious to me. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, and and I think a lot of people with ADHD too, and I, I'm certainly speaking for myself here, I don't mean to speak for the entire community, um, there's a lot of self-confidence issues. And I find that um, when I have like a, a, you know, a crazy wild idea or, you know, a, an idea that might be a couple of steps ahead of other people, I will automatically assume that everybody is there because how could I be thinking ahead of people when actually um, it's it's something that we should perhaps or I should perhaps embrace um, also working on that. And if anybody's worked out how to do that, please let me know. Mm. Yeah, I can almost, for me, I, I seem to oscillate between feeling like I'm invincible and feeling like I know nothing. And it probably is quite domain specific as well. I had an issue yesterday with organizing a conference and not knowing how to do basic things like getting a projector to work, but then other things I'm way ahead of other people. And it's unpredictable for me in terms of knowing what I'm going to excel at versus what I'm not going to be great at. Do you have some things where it's always consistently good or does it vary for you? And daily, I've given up trying to know what I'm doing um, before I do it. But it, it's very true what you say, the incon inconsistency, and that confuses a lot of people. So, for example, I might be, you know, really good at anticipating problems on a particular platform, say WordPress, and working out, you know, the, the things that might go wrong or whatever. But you asked me to... Um, uh, make an old school projector go and I'm with you, I would be like, what? Yes. So uh -huh. I think um, it's a matter of just, for me anyway, I've spent a lot of time allowing myself to not know um, because, uh, you know, being in a, a lot of people who are neurodiverse are also a little bit perfectionist or black and white thinking as well. And um, I find with me I, I'm I used to always want to do everything perfect the first time, mainly to save time. But um, I've really worked on trying to get myself to enjoy the journey. And I hate that cliche, but you need to enjoy the journey. And also to say, well, of course, I don't know everything on the planet, even though I think I should, because nobody does. It's like there's no such thing as the Highlander. Mm. Yeah. Did you get that reference? <laughs> I have watched one of those shows, but I can't quite follow it. Please, what, what was that phrase again? Please, please fill us in about that. There can be only yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, I only know that reference. I haven't seen any of the movies, but so many times I've just used there can be only one. Oh, it's my like goodness. I you have to watch it. I think every neuro neurodiverse person has to watch it because I really identified with a lot of the characters there. And, um, yeah. I secretly think that, you know, I could be the Highlander myself. And then I remember, ah, oh, hang on, it's only a movie. But somewhat ironically, there's more than one Highlander movie, isn't there? Because there's, there's Highlander 2 and Highlander 3, is it not? Yes, I don't think they expected it to be quite the hit it was. But, yes, <laughs> and the, don't watch the other two. It's unspeakable, yes. Oh, so only the first one's worth watching, the other two not so much. Only the first one. Only the first one. So really, there, there can be only one, really. There really can. Yes, that is true. Maybe they meant that. Maybe the, maybe the, the other two, the two or three were awful by design. So they have that meta, that meta Highlander going on. Yeah, and it's sort of like the exception that proves the rule. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so uh, when, you're, when you're not watching Highlander, Amanda, what, what work projects are you concentrating on? Well, I found myself in a job where I, I didn't even know existed when I started it and certainly when I started my career. But um, what I do, what do I do? I basically get all the stuff out of the way that stops publishing stories for CanStar. Um, CanStar is a financial um uh, comparison website and we have a large uh, library of knowledge um, so articles and you know how to's and explainers and you know basically that's where I live 
Um, and we, as I said, we use WordPress and anybody who's used WordPress will know that um, each use of WordPress is very different. Uh, and it's, it's it's quirky, it's it's fun. And so my job is basically to um, streamline the production systems and make it efficient and try and uh, give our readers the best possible experience um, with the least tearing out of hair. So at the moment, what I'm working on is, um, and obviously it's not just me, it's a massive team, but um, streamlining our CMS, our content management system, so that, um, and maybe even looking at uh, different ways to use it and implement it. And it's my comfort zone because it allows me to octopus think and um, it allows me to make connections um, with my writing practice and the technical stuff that I've learned, SEO, all those really interesting things and apply them in new ways. And also then work out how um, it will impact the people who are writing, um, who are producing, and obviously how it's going to impact the reader. I love it. That, that sounds really interesting. And one thing I wanted to ask you about was um, the idea of octopus thinking, because octopus, octopi are amazing creatures. And yes. in order to be uh, able to think like them, I would I would love any tips or tricks. So please, please go on. Octopus thinking. So um, when I love stories, journalists love old stories. Old journalists love old stories even more. Uh, so I was working for um, the... Brisbane newspaper called the Courier Mail and there's a guy called Des Houghton and he's um, very well known in Brisbane and he's um, you know has been around for ages in the um, in the in the field and I heard somebody call him Spaghetti Head. Spaghetti Head, Octopus Thinking, what are you talking about Amanda? So um, he basically did that and you could see him do it. You could see that he would just put out like tentacles from his mind and, I mean, you know, agree or disagree with his politics or the way he writes or who he wrote for or whatever, but the way he thought, he thinks, is amazing. He's like, you could just see these tentacles going. And I went, oh, that's actually a lot like I think, but I've adapted it to be octopus thinking because you don't really want tendrils of spaghetti everywhere you want to be able to focus them into octopus tentacles now this is a very long explanation for a very simple concept of just neurodiverse thinking being a one way of thinking and so octopus thinking is about putting out tentacles into the world and just letting them go and you know they've got little suckers on the bottom of them so you just see what it brings back and then you have a look at it and you connect it to everything else. And then all of a sudden you've got this awesome solution, concept, idea, story, whatever. It's fun. So as opposed to laser-like focus on one topic, it, it involves going quite broad and then bringing the items back together at the end? Yes. But, um, of course, um, it's also very useful in hyper focus as well. So um, if I want to solve a really broad problem with a lot of moving parts, I'll go out that way. Um, but let's just say I need to do a deep dive on um, tax implications of negative gearing, for example. I, I don't know anything about that. Well, I didn't. And so I need to be able to turn my octopus into the reader and basically just work out all the different tentacles that the reader will need to know. And then, so it's more like a hyper-focus, a streamlined darting through the water octopus as opposed to a tentacle one. Mm. Um, but, I mean, it's a, it's a funny concept, but it, it also really helped me come to terms with the fact that I do have a neurodiverse thinking and, and, you know, I am a little bit different to the way I originally viewed myself because I think that's one of the, the biggest things that um, a lot of people say is when they have a late diagnosis is that their identity gets a big hit 
and it changed the way, you know, you, you go through a process of mourning, you go through a process of, oh, my goodness, imagine what I could have been done, the lost potential. Um, and finding these kind of concepts to describe myself and the way that I am makes it feel less scary and more useful rather than something that I have to cope with. Yeah, that makes sense and helps to be able to view it in a, a state of self-acceptance almost, avoiding yes. the self-recrimination. When you were talking about your neurodiversity affecting your productivity, I think in your written answer, you talked about hyperfocus, and I'd be keen to hear how that manifests for you. What's it like when you're in a state of hyperfocus and what are the downsides of it as well? So the hyperfocus has changed over the years. Um, when I was younger and in journalism and had no, you know, familial responsibilities, hyperfocus was my superpower. So I would work long hours. I would work um, very intensely, very deeply, you know, at, sitting at a computer terminal, you know, for hours on end, um, trying to achieve a deadline or put out a paper or, you know, publish a story or contact people or whatever. And that was really quite um, good for me early on in my career. But as you uh, collect things over time, like family and relationships and, you know, debt and houses and dogs and cats and whatever, um, hyperfocus becomes uh, less realistic, all well, the hyperfocus that I used to do. Um, and so I was finding that um, there came a point in my life where I was hyperfocusing on everything. And I burnt out. And this happened two or three times. And so as I've gotten older, I've learned to um, hyper-focus more productively and to notice when I'm hyper-focusing and trying to con control it and channel it the best way I can. Diagnosis obviously helped a lot with that because um, uh, medication helps a lot and, uh, you know, therapy helps a lot. but um, I think I'm a more rounded person now. Don't get me wrong. I still hyperfocus. I hyperfocus on the wrong things a lot of the time. For example, Netflix, binge watching, but I do it at times when I can rather than times that I feel compelled to. Um, and then now I find I can channel my hyperfocus on um, productive tasks at work and um, but I can just manage it more and direct it more. Um, which is much healthier. Mm, yeah, it would be great to hear more about how you channel it. But let's move on to our next question about what you do in your off time. You spoke about various movies that you enjoy. What else? And you've got a dog and a family. What do you get up to in, when you're not working? Job, family, dog. Doesn't leave much time for recreational pursuits. Um, so I have. Um, uh, a neurodiverse family. Uh, my son is autistic and also has ADHD. He's um, he's like level two autistic is is his formal diagnosis. So he has a bit of an invisible um, disability most of the time, um, and then it really comes out when he's stressed and he's uh, eleven. Uh, so that's very interesting time in any child's life, let alone a, an autistic ADHD child. And um, he's such a, oh, everything I thought I knew about autism, all the stereotypes, chuck them out the window because there's no such thing. He is uh, caring, empathetic. He's, he's artistic. He's, um, he's an introvert. He loves drawing, whatever. Um, but, yeah, he's he's on the spectrum. He's got communication issues. So it mainly manifests in social anxiety and um, that obviously impacts our life a lot, um, particularly having a neurodiverse mother um, and having autism and ADHD as a child. That's a very interesting mix too because he has very, very distinct interests and it, it can be very hard for me to get involved with those interests 
without great force on like mental power on my behalf because um who wants to watch the 45th youtube video on making paper planes you know (laughs) so um that's a challenge um my daughter also is um somewhat neurodiverse um she's started uni so she loves it um and hers was a very late diagnosis and all of our diagnoses happened at the same time that my son was diagnosed with autism. And it's very common in families for, especially, you know, with parents who grew up in the 70s, 80s and 90s, for parents to look at their child's, you know, screening tests and go, oh, oh, that's, mm, that's me. And that's what happened to me. So your original question was, what do I do in my spare time? Mainly just lie on the couch and uh, watch TV. <laughs> um, yeah. And when possible, do things that de-escalate all of us, such as cooking, gardening, um, walking, um, you know, playing games, that kind of thing. I see. I imagine it, it's pretty full on with the dealing with multiple people with neurodiversity in one house. It is. It is. It's also hilarious. It is mm-hmm. very funny a lot of the time. And then there's other times that aren't so hilarious and just require work. And uh, we've got a lot of support. Thankfully, we live in a country that has the um, NDIS, National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, and we, well, I mean, we've had an amazing experience with, with that because it allows um, my son to have like a support and um you know I don't I don't know how to support an autistic child like I had to learn we all had to learn my husband had to learn um his sister had to learn um so we get all the help we can because we are not subject experts and that's really helped definitely I'm curious to know about uh, what your morning routine looks like and how's that evolved over time. Uh, is more like smashing the su- snooze button a, a, a few hundred times, um, and that's because my husband's um, it, we, we divide and conquer, uh, and that's the only way to to survive. And um, single parent households, I wow, I admire them so much because wow. Um, so, um, my morning routine is I wake up, I go downstairs and help my, um, son get ready for school and, you know, make sure everything's emotionally stable down there. And then I will use my morning routine as in, you know, getting ready and everything to calm myself and get ready for the day. Um, I, I mainly, start work at home between 8 and 8.30, which um, depending on how, what my my state of mind is at the time. And then I go to work two days a week because cat stars are awesome. And I catch the train. Uh, and I find that um, the biggest shock for me when COVID happens was I didn't realise how much I was using those in between times in the commute to transition to a new environment. Um, That's one of my big problems with ADHD is that it just takes a little bit for my brain to kind of arrive, sort of like my body arrives, and then like, I don't know, half an hour later my brain will walk in the door, um, which can be frustrating for, you know, husband and children who, you know, need me to do stuff for you know need me t- to look at their drawing of this awesome truck or whatever so I find that I use the commute time to transition working from home very difficult to do that and um, I'm, I've actually been struggling a lot with that but um, I just started a system where I book in my diary every morning uh, 15 to 30 minutes um, which is just basically get ready for the daytime. And it's just where I focus and centre 
might get a cup of tea um, and just, you know, make sure that I'm present wherever I am. Because otherwise, if I don't start that way during the day, my mind is still at the last place and I can't give my full attention to wherever I am. Yeah, that sounds really important. I have to do something similar as well to get myself into the work groove. Yes. Especially if there's been some things that you've had to do to, to help your son in the morning that might be hard to detach at times. Do you find, is it, you were saying that working from home is more difficult. Is that the reason that you don't have that transition time with the commute? And so you have to create an artificial transition. Yes, absolutely. And also, um, I have a long history of being a bit lackadaisical when it comes to um, household tasks. And um, I have rehabilitated myself. And but the, the problem is that there's a lot of guilt involved. I carry a lot of guilt um, from, uh, you know, it's just programmed um, into, into me. So I'll be sitting here and if the environment around me is messy or the house is messy or whatever, um, it doesn't feel right. And so it's it's very hard for me to come compartmentalise and say it's okay that, you know, the kitchen looks like a trash can. I've got to work now. I struggle to do that because um, uh, my environment is very important to me. So um, that makes it hard. The other thing that is hard is um, when there's other people in the house. So what I do for work is very, um, can be very intense, very, you know, deep thinking. And um, when you have to get out of that deep thinking and swim up to the surface and then just like think normally, the energy that is involved in swimming up and down it can be exhausting. And so I don't know if anybody else does this, but I do this. I often try and hold my attention at the spot where I was while I'm talking to somebody else. It seems like I'm not interested. Um, it seems like I'm, you know, I'm not there for them or whatever, or I'm being rude. Um, just that I don't have to swim up and down and waste all my energy, right? Mm. It's just efficient, right? That's fine with work people, but you can't do that to your family. That's just like rude, you know. And my work people get it, you know. They, they, you know, they know how I work. But I, how do you explain to an eleven-year-old that yes, you're the most important person in my life, but I'm thinking about how to um, code this table right now, and if I lose my train of thought, I will have to spend thirty minutes trying to get back into that headspace. So. Um, you know, it's the juggle. Every parent, every person, I think, gets the juggle. Um, it's just a little extra hard when it involves working from home, your own diversity, your own diverse kids, and a dog. Mm. Is your son at home a lot of the week? He's not. He he's at school, which is great. Mm. Um, and because uh, you know he's he's quite bright and everything. It's just. Um, uh, got social behavioural issues, but the worst time. And and if anybody is listening out there who works with working mothers and fathers who have children that come home at 3 o'clock and then, like, you can just see that if you're on a meeting or something, their energy changes, this is why. Mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's really, it's, you know, they come home at 3 and, you know, kids don't get boundaries and you know mommy's not available for you at the moment um it's very hard to you know compartmentalize in that way as well yeah so at least when I'm at work it's only the one train compartment that I have to be in yeah I don't have children but even sometimes if my wife often works with at home as well and I mean, she's generally respectful of if I'm in a meeting, she's not going to come in. But that experience of of having very deep focus, which can be quite elusive for me, and I'm curious about for you, you were talking about channeling hyper-focus. 
for me, it, it's quite precious when I'm able to get into that state. And it's, I almost feel annoyed at people if they interrupt me during that point. Totally. <laughs> totally. I, I um, am seeming to use a lot of animal and like metaphors at the moment. But anyway, it's like a tick, you know, if you burrow down deep, you don't want to get removed. Um, You're describing so, yourself as a tick. Interesting. I know. Uh, uh, octopuses uh, are cute, not so sure about ticks. Yeah, okay. I'll have to work on that metaphor. <laughs> but, um, to be honest, I don't actually know when I, like the moment I started be able to be able to do this. And sometimes I can't do it. Like if something's like they've said boring, there is like no way that I can that I can get there. Um, so I guess the, the the way that I start is um, I'll prepare my space, prepare my my mental and physical space to work on a big project, um, and then I'll have my you know attention props. So things like good old know sensory toys and and I think it it really helps to be able to know what your triggers are so knowing yourself really well is the first step to be able to do anything about it and my issue is as with all ADHD people the level of stimulation that you have so under stimulation is um, just as bad as over stimulation and we're aiming for the midline of effective um, you know, which is effective. Um, and so if I'm understimulated, um, I'll reach for, um, you know, the sensory toys. I'll, um, it's terrible and it's very, very bad for me, but chocolate, something nice to eat, a hot drink, you know, a sensory input. So that part of my, you know, uh, system, because we're talking about a holistic system here. Um, and that's the thing about, a lot of ADHD people is that it's the ability to regulate our systems that can cause us the most problems. And so I've got my physical stuff going. Um, mentally, um, I will, uh, you know, try and be calm and relax, but um, then maybe play some really loud music to shut my mind off. Okay. What type um, of music? Yep. Yeah, so this is under stimulation. And I also might hijack um, hijack something that I love to try and segue into what I maybe not want to do. So an example of this could be if I'm writing a story which doesn't particularly, um, you know, interest me, I will find um, a link to something that I really like. So how to refinance a home loan. Although I do find that interesting. I actually can't think of an example because uh, my brain won't let me because I'm really, you know, interested at the moment. Um, Maybe that's a tactic, though, that you've found work that is intrinsically interesting for you. Yes, yes, and and yes. So, so if, if I could, you know, compare it to something I absolutely hate, which is folding the washing. Okay. I don't, I don't know, if you like folding the washing, congratulations. You should patent yourself and uh, come and work at my house. So I hate folding the washing, something that has to be done every day. And so I've managed to hyper-focus on it by creating the optimum environment that clothes folding is the most interesting thing ever. So I'll put on my favourite movie not the Highlander, but something like it. Um, I'll Or I'll listen to some music. I'll have a drink, whether that's an alcoholic beverage of the evening or like, you know, a cup of tea or, you know, something fizzy. Um, and then I will attack it as if it's a computer game. So I'll divide all the clothes into piles and, you know, try and tie myself, fold up the washing really quickly or like, you know, set myself a deadline or my husband's getting home at, you know, 12.32, I'm going to get it done by 12.31. Just all these little, you know, um, motivational quirks. And in the end, I find that I folded up all the washing and I wasn't even aware that I was folding up the washing. 
So that's a really boring example, but one that I imply regularly in, in my work. On the other hand, when I'm overstimulated, so my brain is just going full octopus and it's very hard to work in that environment when my brain is too stimulated on a project. Um, I will work to calm my senses down. So that might be literally going to work in the um, walk-in wardrobe so that it's dark, quiet, and um, a little bit cool. I bought some of those um, noise, uh, not noise cancelling because that just freaks me out because I can hear my breathing and everything, but the uh, noise reducing um, headphones that aren't electronic. Um, I think they're called Loop. Um, There's, you know, plenty around like that. Um, I'll I'll put that on. I'll uh, put on a really soft jumper and I'll just get all of my senses really comfortable to calm me down. And then maybe write a big list of all the things that are crushing in my mind just so that I can find a little window of space that I can hyper-focus to the extent that I need to to get the task done. Oh, that sounds exhausting. (laughs) It works. It doesn't, it's not as painful as it sounds. Oh, Amanda, I think I think you've uh, made us all feel really bad because you've been been able to turn folding folding clothes into a game. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to steal your tactics too. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think I think um, yeah, <laughs> you found a way to make uh, folding clothes an enjoyable experience. So I think that that's great. Uh, but I'd like to know about some bad habits that you have. So can you tell us about habits you'd like to remove? Bad habits or any, any habits that you feel like take too much time? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a fine line between setting up your environment for success and procrastinating. So I, um, my daughter calls it procrastibusy. Um, but, you know, it has its place. You know, it really does have its place. But, yeah, I can procrastinate. Um, so there's certain jobs that I just hate doing, like, you know, um, following up on phone calls to, you know, tradespeople or whatever. Like, I mean, come on, you know, this, I just, I don't have the bandwidth. Um, and so I just procrastinate, procrastinate. We've developed a handy system in our household where my husband will text me constantly in increasing, in decreasing amounts of time until I do it. Uh, he's the most patient man in the universe, I swear. No, and Honestly, it works because, um, and I've asked him to, it's not as if he's, you know, bow beating, beating me or anything, but I legitimately forget. So um, how is that a bad habit? Oh, yeah, I would like to stop procrastinating. Um, also, um, I'd like to stop making up for my um, dopamine deficit by eating chocolate and just eating. like. Um, or, or numbing or whatever that doesn't actually work. Like all these things that I used to do back before I knew what was going on to try and cope actually don't help. So I would like to try and reprogram myself and remove a few of those habits. The other habit I would like to drop is talking so much about things I like to talk about. Well, yeah. it, it, on this show, that is more than okay. <laughs> I can relate to that some things really leaving them into the last minute and requiring a lot of prompting from my wife to get them done. Yes. So I almost wondered with your husband sending all those text messages, do you ever feel like how about he just does it instead of sending the text messages? Yeah, I do. I really do. <laughs> but, but I understand, like, he carries a large load himself and it's also a way that he kind of expresses love as well because he cares enough to help me do it rather than do it for me. Mm. Yeah. At at some point I'll just do it and, you know, whatever, but sometimes it's also becomes a game because I don't want to do it. I'll see how many text messages he can send me. That. <laughs> okay. Does he do increasing intensities of emojis as well? 
<laughs> and, and then it will start like on the Facebook Messenger and <laughs> Instagram Messenger and send me funny gifts and you know gifs, gifs, whatever, and yeah. memes and yeah, it gets quite funny. Notes, yeah, hmm. it's funny. Humor solves the world's problems. Hmm. I've got some flights to book. I might suggest my wife does that for me. Now, yes. S- speaking of landing flights how do you switch off at night and and land your consciousness into the the nestle of your bed what's your wind down routine um okay so i've often found it quite difficult to wind down in fact i've gone particularly previous to diagnosis i i went a lot of time without sleep and that's really bad um because it just unbalances everything. It's not good. So I try and guard my sleep as much as I can. Now, so my nighttime routine um, consists of really strict compartmentalization for finishing work. Um, back in the day, I used to work into the night and, you know, really go with my hyperfocus, but I just, can't do that because it's it's too mentally taxing. So I say, right, so I'm finishing at this time, I mark it in my diary, and then I, you know, close off, walk into the kitchen and start my real job, which is being a parent. And then, you know, there's the whole family nighttime routine where there's, you know, like homework and dishes and cooking and talking and whatever. And then there, there, there comes a point in the night where like the energy changes of the house and everybody kind of goes, ah. and the house itself just about size. Um, and usually that time is when, um, you know, the dishes are done. At the moment, it's when maths is on, it's about to start. And then we sit down as a family and try and have some, you know, human relation contact um for you know at least 10 minutes 20 minutes um we try and have dinner together too which is really great increasingly difficult with a 18 year old daughter anyway and then we um you know kids go off to bed or to the nightclub or whatever and then um you know my husband and I have some time to talk and maybe we'll watch some tv but at that stage we're just like you know and so really tired so we might fall asleep on the couch but um, um my son has a bedtime routine which is very important for him too so um being a, an autistic child routine is very important and so we take him up to his room um you know get him ready and then he listens to an audio book um i might lie with him in you know, and you know sit with him and we'll Know, answers answer the universe's greatest questions, which is really hard to do after a full day of work at like eight o'clock at night when your child asks you, do you believe in God? And does the universe have an edge? And <laughs> the appropriate answer is not, I'll just Google that. So I've been using that as my calm down routine as well. Um, but yeah, just a gentle wind down. And then I'm very guarded. Like I set, you know, I go to sleep between 10 and 10.30. That's it. Um, and then I wake up between 6.30 and 7. Um, and if I stray outside those parameters, that's when things get hairy. That sounds like a, an excellent way to wind down, to have some time for preparing everything for the next day some time with the family and then a good amount of sleep as well. Yes. Yes. I would like to fit in exercise and, uh, you know, some other me time things, but yeah. Right. Yeah. Amanda, I'd like to talk to you a bit more about um, Highlander. No, just kidding. I would, <laughs> like, I would like to, t- like you mentioned that as a, as a great resource for, for neuro neurodiverse people to, to, um, to take a look at, but I was also wondering, are there any other resources like books, philosophies or apps that you find most helpful in productivity and habit formation? 
Uh, yes, so all the golden greats. Um, so I use my Google Calendar and Apple Calendar uh, like it is water. If I didn't have those, I would drown. Hoping to transition to Trello uh, soon just so that I can have it in an app, um, that just one app because because I need a calendar that's not only work, I need a family calendar and, a, you know, there's so many different calendars. And time is an issue for me. So if I didn't have that um, calendar, I just I turn up at birthday parties when they finish and not when they start. So many times. Um, okay, so there's there's that. Um, what else do I use? Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts, um, uh, particularly meditation podcasts. Lately, when my mind is uh, racing, that's something that. Um, that really helps, particularly sleep meditation. Uh, if I'm away, I'll listen to um, various sleep. Uh, some are better than others, though, and some like creepy and some are nice. So it takes a while. I really love Alain de Botton. Hope I'm saying his name right because you know when you read a name and you don't know whether or not he's saying it right. Anyway, um, he wrote a book called Consolations of Philosophy, and it's like you know, the most read book um, by me in this house. Uh, he has a section on consolations about work or whatever, and it says in it, um, thank God for work, otherwise we'd all be bored. And that made me feel better about working so much and being a perfectionist. So I I, I reach for those type of books a lot. And Adam Grant, who's an organisational psychologist, uh, he's got some great um, content, including a wonderful, everybody knows it, Work Life um, podcast, uh, where he talks about organisational psychology, believe it or not, and, um, you know, good and bad and how you can hack it to, to make it work for you. The only other thing that I use, it's neither an app, a philosophy or a uh, what was the third thing? Anyway, whatever it was, uh, is therapy. Um, I have a very, very good uh, therapist who I've been seeing for ages who has experience in new neurodiversity um, and she just helps me decompress and um, form strategies for coping with um, the neurodivergent life. That sounds like a really good collection and I would be keen to also know about the sensory toys as well. That should be another category too. Have you got one that's a squishy one? And Yes. So I have a squishy one, a squishy mm. one. Uh, I, these are actually my sons and I use them when he's at school, but don't tell him because he will get cranky. Uh, <laughs> so there's a squishy one I love. Uh, there's this one, which is just like it's a marble in a something, I don't know, and um, it just gives me feedback. Um, also, fidget spinners uh, are great. Um, I have a textured mat underneath my chair, which is good for the feet. Um, it, it, giving sensory feedback for the feet when you're writing is very important because, you know, you're doing this and all of this and then the rest of the body gets bored. And that's not a good thing. Um, and the one thing I don't use is anything with clicking. It drives me crazy. But each to their own. Hmm. They look a lot safer than my toy, which is a, a pocket knife. Oh, yes. Yes. And, a, and it's a bit clicky, but it's quite dangerous. I should get something that's a bit safer to use. Well, let me see. There are, look at this. Like this one is like all clicks. I hate it. My son, he loves it. So, yes, please <laughs> do. <laughs> <laughs> Each their own. Okay. And final two questions. Where can people connect with you or find your work? Okay. So, um, Canstar, uh, financial comparison website, canstar.com.au. Um, I also wrote, uh, was, wrote a chapter in a book called uh, Letter to My 10-Year-Old Self, which is available online uh, through Amazon, I believe. And it's got just got st a few stories about um, people who have overcome 
stuff like getting a late ADHD diagnosis um, and what I would write to myself if I was 10. Um, And obviously you can find me on LinkedIn. Beautiful. We'll include your LinkedIn link in the show notes. It's been wonderful having you on, Amanda. Do you have any final words to ask of our audience? Just be kind to yourself, I think. I was I was going to give this big spiel about, you know, my number one trick to whatever, but I don't think there is one for everyone. I think you've just got to find what works for you. First, first stop is to know yourself and do the work and, you know, don't be afraid to view things as symptoms or, you know, things about you and just it's okay to be an octopus or a spaghetti head or, a tick. you know, a tick, whatever you want to be. Um, just be yourself because, um, you know, we definitely do contribute to society and, you know, I can't wait until the world realises, you know, that people like us have amazing skills to contribute and um, I think we're three quarters of the way there. Um, yeah, just be kind to yourself. Wonderful. And we'll wrap the show with that. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Focus and Chill podcast. To listen to other episodes, jump onto podcast.focusbear.io. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or you know someone who'd be a good fit, email us at team at focusbear.io. Otherwise, stay focused, stay chilled and peace out. <laughs>